Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to um, the last panel of uh, the Hungry City uh, workshop. Um, this is the closing panel for the day and also for the event. Um, before we begin our session, though, I'd like to um, just have a couple of administrative announcements. Uh, first, we request that you do not take photos, videos, screenshots, or recordings of today's session. Um, second, we welcome audience questions, which we will be discussing after all speakers have presented. Uh, you can enter your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And if you'd like to follow up or continue to this, the discussion with the speakers, you may share your email address in the Q&A function as well. Uh, my name is Faris, I'll be the moderator for this uh, panel. Uh, and today we have um, four panelists speaking uh, in just a while. We've got Dr. Faiza Zakaria, uh, Ms. Kimberly Ho, Mr. Elliot Ong, and Dr. Anthony Medrano. Um, I'll introduce each of them before they turn to go. Um, right now, I'll just introduce our first uh, speaker, Dr. Faiza Zakaria, um, um, and Anthony, right? Are you going on this first session as well? No, it's just, it's just uh, Dr. Faiza. So Dr. Faiza Zakaria is Assistant Professor of History at Nanyang Technological University, uh, specializing in modern Southeast Asia. She holds a PhD in history from Yale University and an MA in Southeast Asian Studies from NUS. She's presently working on an NHB funded project called Polyglot Medical Traditions in Southeast Asia with PI Michael Stanley Baker. Um, so without further delay, I think we can kick right off. Uh, Dr. Faiza, over to you. Great, thanks so much, Faris. Let me just uh, try and figure out how to share my screen, which is not something I do instinctively. Okay, great. There you go. Is that, is that clear? Great. Let me just check uh, and put this on full screen well. Okay, so hi, yeah, thanks a lot. So um, I would like to thank uh, the YNC organizers for this wonderful event. I've been listening to a lot of great presentations uh, today. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to join in yesterday. Um, and this panel in some ways is a bit different from what has gone before because um, in all previous panels, we've been focusing, I think, more directly on food. And um, this panel largely focuses on medicine. And I'm using the idea of nutrition, I think, to bridge the two histories together, the histories of food as well as the history of medicine, um, so that we can um, think about uh, food more broadly as something that's nourishing that brings about um, health and other benefits. And um, understand then how um, that contributes to sort of a diff, uh, an understanding of both health and our bodies. So let me start maybe with a definition of nutrition. So if you kind of go down the dictionary, the definition route of um, finding a definition for nutrition, you can find it being defined as the process of providing food necessary for health and growth. And that includes um, all kinds of nourishment for health and growth and um, with an emphasis on the balance of different kinds of food groups and um, proportions of different sort of um, vitamins and minerals. So you would be considered malnourished if you lack particular nutrients. And in contemporary times, we tend to understand the process of um, nutrition as being related to, but not exactly congruent with the process of therapy. So nutrition um, helps to create a healthy body that prevents illness. But at the same time, um, it's not exactly congruent to therapeutics as therapeutics help to mitigate the impact of illness and facilitate recovery. So in present times, we tend to kind of split and um, find a, a uh, create, I think, a, a sharp distinction between the two. But the line between care and therapy has not always been um, clear, has not always been tightly bounded. And this is especially too, true with regards to um, traditional medicine, as I'll show in this presentation. Okay. So um, what I'll be focusing on is a period from 1880s to the 1930s, roughly, where we see, I think, still the preponderance of traditional medical systems um, in Singapore and also the Malay world more broadly. Um, and um, 
the historical consumption of herbs and other sort of drugs to promote health and growth. So one thing that um, I would be questioning here is what has been historically consumed? Why has it been consumed? And what can we tell about the ideas of health and growth and the body itself in the past from this consumption? And in the 1920s and the 1930s, we start seeing um, urban Malay communities, not just in Singapore, but also in Penang and, and other parts of um, the Malay Peninsula encountering over-the-counter medicine. And I'll be looking at um, some of the advertisements of this kind of over-the-counter medicine and the continuities and changes with regards to thinking about um, consuming um, products that promote um, certain health benefits and what um, that says about changing ideas of the body in Singapore and other uh, parts of the uh, Malay Peninsula at that time. So some sources that I'll be um, using with regards to sort of gleaning some ideas about um, the herbs and plants that's being consumed um, from in the Malay medical tradition would be um, Kitab Tip, for, uh, which um, basically is a kind of uh, manuscript that captures um, medical remedies used uh, by uh, traditional healers of the past. Some of them were uh, produced and recorded in Malay courts. Some of them were circulated anonymously um, in um, different parts of the Malay world in various um, villages by various Bomos and Pawans who didn't leave their names um, behind. So we have full manuscripts available. We have anonymous uh, manuscripts of this um, sort as well. And we also have chapters of texts of um, different Malay uh, manuscripts that talks about uh, medicine. Um, so here, what I'll be doing is not to unpack sort of the use of the sources, but to draw some examples from them in terms of uh, what has been consumed for healthful benefits. What does that say about health? So when we talk about uh, Kitab Tib, for example, the word Tib itself um, references lost health. And it can be defined as it was in one of these manuscripts, um, which um, was produced in Patani at the end of the 19th century, as the knowledge of preserving existing health and of returning lost health. So what is interesting is that the index two parts to healing, and that's to... Um, have good character as well as all things that's related to it and as well as healing the physical body and as we see in these examples that we um that i'll be bringing up that the um the issue of nutrition is also tied to the issue of good conduct so what do what was consumed um during this period so one of the most sort of famous um a persistent, I think, medical, uh, traditional medicine that's still um, you, uh, consumed today is Jammu in Indonesia. And you can see that kind of uh, dating back all the way to the time when Borobudur was built. And you can see kind of bus relief of this uh, uh, consumption of Jammu in that um, the temple itself. So um, what is being consumed basically are uh, usually decoction, decoctions of herbs as well and, and or animal parts um, in particular proportions, in particular mixture. So that's uh, sort of one um, uh, element of a kind of um, kind of um, what a uh, medicine that was consumed. Another, and that's more of something that's a bit more um, surprising in some ways, is the consumption of words itself. It's, and we'll see some kind of example of words that's written on leaves or words that's written with a particular type of ink and then drowned. And these are also considered sort of, um, in a way, nutritious and healthful and will bring about some kind of healthful uh, benefits. And there's also a kind of ritualistic aspect to consuming um, all these sort of nutritious ingredients and uh, we'll see that uh, kind of being embedded in, in the way some of these um, concoctions were consumed. Oops. Okay, so consumption of plants, herbs and plants, some of it is fairly um, straightforward. Here there is one um, Example of, I think if you look at the picture, the uh, Malay so-called medical man from uh, the uh, collection at the University Library, you can see kind of he's holding a couple of um, bottles at the back, um, 
selling sort of his concoctions, selling his um, uh, medical products. And that sort of parallels some of the um, ways in which Jammu was sold on Java itself. You can see also women kind of carrying bottles of the, um, of the concoctions that they were selling um, and bringing them out, um, out of rural areas to the um, urban areas. And um, what do these sort of um, concoctions help to do? So they provide um, nutrition for very much everyday sort of um, problems, for example, for children who cry or refuse to eat. Um, for postpartum illnesses, for uh, provide some kind of therapy for illnesses such as fevers, bloating, um, body aches, and so on. And they also provide um, some form of therapy for addiction such as for opium addiction. So what kind of herbs are active ingredients in these um, concoctions? I think for the Indonesian jamu um, in and I think people who are sort of more expert in this would uh, correct me here, but as a basis, often you have turmeric or Javanese turmeric, kamangal, um, temulawa, which is a form of um, kurkuma, and cardamom, and then um, palm sugar, lime, and some kind of variation of other sort of herbs, depending on the um, condition that's being treated. I don't find that as systematic um, in the manuscripts of my medicine that I've examined. Um, some of these um, remain foundational ingredients, but Malays also often use uh, lemongrass, ginger, garlic, um, lopoyang, which is kind of bitter ginger. Um, member of the ginger family, it's more bitter. Um, and, um, and often, if it was a kind of ritual, um, camphor would be used as a kind of added to the mixture as a kind of refresher if the decoction was left overnight and has to be consumed over the next um, few days. So, um, the sort of main idea or kind of predominant um, way of thinking about the use of such herbs is that they function to balance hot and cold. So you have certain properties or certain uh, these uh, properties of hot and cold being associated with certain herbs and the property of being hot and cold also associated with um, the disease or the kind of um, imbalance that you actually have. So Consuming something nutritious then becomes part of being balanced and being balanced in this case um, between the so-called hot and the so-called cool. So these are categories that uh, can be difficult um, to define, um, but they underpin, I think, some of the ways in which um, some of these remedies um, were formulated. Um, so, for example, um, for as medicine for wind um, and aching joints, semi a uh, kind of disease of cold then it's sort of balanced off with um, herbs that have this sort of um, hot essences. So, um, so one element of that aspect of um, consuming herbs of for nutrition value um, would aim at balancing sort of the hot and cold elements of the body. Um, another and um, is to use to some extent a mixture of herbs as well as charms and a mixture of application as well as um, consumption. So some of that would be related to how we treat um, children and prevent them, for example, for crying or try to feed a child who just refuses to eat. And the, um, the recommendations in some of these manuscripts indicate um, a kind of mixture of um, using particular herbs as well as um, using charms on right, written on a lunga leaf that a child would then eat, or that um, that would be um, recited by the parent and blown out towards the child. So in postpartum illnesses as well, we kind of see a ritual element um, in this sort of um, consumption of um, remedies for um, this sort of illnesses. So it includes. Um, herbal um, remedies such as um, using mustard seed and garlic and, and the, uh, the leaf of a, a colosia, which is basically a dog bloody, um, and then leaving that overnight exposed to dew and it must be eaten in a particular way, um, in a particular direction and um, in a particular um, uh, it, 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 in a particular order. So the way in which uh, ritual self becomes incorporated um, in the consumption of drugs for this sort of illnesses um, 
highlights that um, illness is not just about consuming, uh, it cannot just be remedied just by consuming a particular um, concoction or decoction. It's not just about the material interaction of healthful element A to, uh, to kind of um, mitigate sick element B. But what um, is also being um, addressed here is the sort of um, idea of illness is also being part of an effort imbalance between different um, elements, um, in the, between the different natural elements as well as the supernatural. So um, conditions like Maroyan or uh, the sort of postpartum illness is often related back to um, imbalances um, with um, the uh, spirit world or with the sort of, um, or with psychos a kind of psychosocial um, illness. And that involves, I think, a more um, ritualistic aspect that also in, that's also incorporated in the uh, consumption of these, um, um, these remedies. So related, I think, uh, to that would be sort of examples of eating not things that we just normally think of as food, but literally eating words. So for example, a wonderful article that GDU in the Recipes Project discusses one of the manuscripts from the Indonesia's National Library, which talks about how if you wish to memorize the Quran, you should take the ambergris, mass and turmeric, um, make an ink and write a particular prayer in a white bowl and then drink it for seven days. So you literally, in some ways, um, create um, consuming something that's nutritious for your memory and that something is literary words and that's it um, that's a kind of interesting idea in which we're thinking about um, healthfulness not just in terms of uh, the sort of health benefits of grace mask and turmeric but also the health benefits that come with the words you've created um, with this and therefore communication and words are in themselves um, healthful and beneficial so to sort of quickly summarize, what are some of the ideas that's being implied um, by the examples of how um, the body is nourished um, in this ways um, in traditional medicine? Um, first, we could argue that uh, nutritional uh, nutrition, in some extent, is relational. I said it's it's interface with communication. It opens up the body to healthful influences from the natural, the divine, and the supernatural. And when we think about deficient nutrition, then or can think of it as an imbalance between hot and cold that's not directly related to disease, but it's manifested um, by behavior. And when we conceptualize disease like that, we're essentially blurring between material um, consumption and communication, we're blurring lines between psychosocial and physical illnesses. And uh, that's an important um, element because um, as we see in the next part of the presentation, I think one of the major changes in encountering in traditional medicine, encountering um, biomedicine was that sort of um, sharper distinction that becomes drawn between psychosocial and physical illness. But when we look at, I think, traditional medicine, then um, it's important to think of the body not just as an autonomous entity, um, which we tend to think of it now, but to, to see the body's interaction with nutrients as neither universal or uniform. So, Particular remedies need not necessarily have the same impact um, if they're applied to different bodies, if they're consumed by different body and the body um, non-autonomy in that sense precludes a kind of universal remedy. And that's a bit different from over-the-counter medicine, which by concept in itself sells itself as uniform remedies, possibly uh, for certain sort of diseases. And we can see the uh, popularity of over-the-counter medicine in the 1920s and 30s um, in urban cities um, in Singapore as well as um, Penang. And here I'm going to um, use medical advertisements from Saudara, Penang newspaper, which ran from 1928 to 1941 and had considerable number of subscribers um, in Singapore. So you could see a number of uh, different kind of tonics that's being consumed and advertised um, during that time. And I'm going to use our much um, beloved CMIO model to give examples of this, starting with the Chinese um, tonic. So um, you have tonics that's being used to um, treat um, basically worms, toothaches or eyes, um, insect bites and so on. 
pretty much, uh, costing about 10 cents, you know, pretty much used to kind of um, treat all sorts of illnesses and branded um, as Chinese from medical stores and mass marketed to the Malay market. And as you can see, sort of Malay is also coming on to that scene um, with their own sort of multi-purpose herbal tonics. Um, here, this is the Angur Islami tonic pill, um, which is uh, purported to be can use them for headaches, for faintness, for fatigue, for menstrual cramps, for anemia, for impotence on males, tuberculosis, incontinence, pretty much um, the works. And again, the kind of uh, dominated by branding with the male expert there. It kind of, in some ways, um, follows the sort of Chinese medical hall model, but um, takes the um, herbal tonic um, and recreates that as kind of a Malay um, um, invention and commercialize that. So you have um, other tonics like the Lodra uterine tonic kind of displacing the uh, treatments from Maroya and um, that has been um, um, more predominant for, um, in the 19th century. For example, here um, we talk about um, regulating hormonal problems and menses and other menstrual problems using particular, um, this particular tonic I think um, was marketed both for the Chinese as well as um, for Malays. And you have possibly British over-the-counter tonics as well. So this is like Crooks Optical Pills, which is, I put British in inverted commas, partly because um, it's not quite clear that this was actually from a British company. So there was a British um, company called Crooks Laboratory that was set up in 1912. That uh, that also that import uh, that sold patent medicine and that uh, formulated um, that um, formulated I think um, tonics for common everyday diseases, but um, it's not clear that they ever sold anything called optical pills, um, which included um, tonics for bad skin to improve blood flow, um, kidney pills. Um, as a result, um, with pain on your kidney, kind of giving you backache. Um, pills to control, control no, no, nocturnal emissions, um, so called de-emission pills, and uh, cough lozenges. So here we can see through the advertisements, and I particularly like this advertisement because of the way it kind of symbolizes one of the key changes that I see during the period, which is the kind of advent of the anatomical body. And here the anatomy of this guy uh, kind of comes into view right away. Um, the, what we can see, I think, from the popularity and the way in which um, tonic pills, over-the-counter medicine, um, is marketed to urban populations is uh, that there are continuities with the previous medical tradition. You still have kind of um, an untransparent um, tonic that's been sold as a remedy, often for many different sort of diseases that we would now, as contemporary patients, think of as distinct um, conditions. So the sort of popularity of cure all tonics um, remained as one of the things that I think um, is continuous between traditional Malay medicine and the sort of over the counter medicine that has um, relationships in some ways to a more sort of um, universal, universal ideas of the body. Um, and it also continues, I think, these tonics at least, to pathologize um, unbecoming conduct, especially in regards to things like, um, things that are related to sex and hormones. Uh, for example, nocturnal emissions and, um, and menstrual um, issues. But we could also see, as mentioned, I think the change in how the body is viewed as an autonomous, um, as an autonomous um, entity that where environmental influences and psychosocial relationships no longer become part of the way you consume um, medicine, where you see more imported um, ingredients from various traditions, less local um, um, herbs sort of incorporated in this, and the um, ways in which uh, male authority becomes uh, more centralized um, in medical interventions and um, in providing expertise about um, medicine and health. So I'll just sort of um, bring this back, I think, um, to the idea of linking medicine and food and highlight that what I hope to have shown in this presentation is that the line between nutrition as care and nutrition as therapy has not always um, been very clear. And um, 
that line becomes even more blurred when we historicize nutrition and glimpse it as not just the sort of individual consumption of health food, foods uh, for particular health benefits, but as a common soul experience, which means that we need to consider how, when, and with whom something is consumed. And that sort of consideration becomes as important as exactly what is being consumed. And um, rethinking, I think, the idea of nutrition for the body as um, something that involves ingesting um, one particular substance to modify an autonomous uh, body that has impermeable boundaries. I think that in some ways, when we look at the um, sort of historical consumption of um, medicine, um, that sort of conceptualization uh, comes across as a modern conception that uh, we may want to question. So, yeah, thank you so much. I hope I didn't, yeah, exactly 2.40, so yeah. Thanks. Yeah, we're good on time. Thank you so much, Dr. Faiza, for that uh, really enlightening um, uh, presentation that raises some really interesting issues about how, you know, remedies, uh, as we understand them as a purely, you know, kind of like something that targets specific physiological symptoms uh, wasn't always the case in, in, in uh, Malay society. Um, and also, I, I really liked your point on changing ideas surrounding the body. Uh, but we'll address that later on in further detail in the Q&A. Uh, we'll move on now to Miss Kimberly Ho. Um, Miss Kimberly Ho is a rising environmental studies senior at Yale and US College with a strong interest in environmental justice and political ecology. Her work is focused on uncovering how different nature society relations come about, especially when it comes to power relations and extensive supply chains. She hopes that her work is able to help people better understand the realities and complexities of how people produce and consume. Over to you, Kimberly. Thanks so much, Faris. Let me just share my screen really quick. Okay, hope everyone can see this. Okay, so hi everyone, um, I'm Kimberly and today I'm gonna to be talking about um, the manufactured product Scott's Emulsion and its significance in Singaporean childhood. So this was a short research project that I did about a year ago um, in a class with Professor Anthony Madrano. And, you know, although taking a daily spoonful of Scott's emulsion may not necessarily be your own personal experience or a universal experience by every Singaporean child, I hope that this presentation uh, can be insightful for you. But in any case, um, my interest in this topic stems from my own personal childhood experience. And also, um, I found it to be a common experience amongst my peers. So just to dive into the presentation, I would like to explain what Scott's Emulsion is briefly. So Scott's Emulsion is a liquid health supplement containing cod liver oil as its active ingredient. And Scott claims that by taking two to three tablespoons of Scott's Emulsion daily provides immune support for both children and adults by helping to meet their daily vitamin A and D requirements. And it's also a source of um, omega-3 fatty acids and calcium. So in 2020, the Scott's website also claimed that over a million people take Scott's emulsion um, daily. And you may recognize it by its very bright and blue and orange packaging in your local supermarket or local drugstore, um, and also as seen on the left side of the slide. Um, there are currently different versions of Scott's emulsions, and um, today I'll be focusing more on the original formula, which is a very smooth, um, opaque white liquid that has a distinctly fishy smell and taste, and, but they have since developed new um, vitamin products such as pastels and gummies, and they are the self-proclaimed number one kids vitamin brand in Singapore. So just from this description itself, um, there were two initial questions that I wanted to explore when I first started this project. Firstly, I wanted to know the story of how a non-native fish species like cod could become an ingredient in um, a popular health supplement in Singapore. So more specifically, I wanted to know where exactly this remedy came from and how exactly Singapore's came, Singaporeans came to trust it. Uh, secondly, I was also interested to know whether the act of consuming Scott's emulsion could be considered a form of cultural memory. So exactly what role does Scott's emulsion play in reinforcing specific notions of the past and how those, re, um, how those notions are reinforced? So yes, to begin answering that first question as to how something like cod liver oil could become a popular health supplement in Singapore, I first dug into how cod liver oil as a health remedy first came about anyway. So the first use of cod liver oil as a health remedy is not 
exactly well known or well documented, but it's suggested that cod liver oil was first consumed in Northern Europe, which is unsurprising seeing as cod is natively from there. So the first people known to consume it were also unsurprisingly the fishermen who would catch the cod. Um, and this gave an impression that cod liver oil was a food for fishing people and for peasantry. So its most popular use was as a remedy for rickets, which commonly occurs in children who have a vitamin D deficiency um, and can lead to stunted growth. So this was a problem in Northern Europe um, where there are periods of inadequate sunlight, especially during the winter, um, and that prevents um, vitamin D from being absorbed into the body or being produced by the body when in contact with sunlight. Um, yeah, so these, the benefits of cod liver oil uh, made sense as a remedy at a time because um, cod liver oil does contain large amounts of vitamin A, D, and omega-3 fatty acids. And despite the portrayal of cod liver oil as a remedy for the poor, the benefits of consuming cod liver oil soon caught the attention of physicists all around Europe, such as in Germany around the 1820s, where cod liver oil was then used as a remedy for rheumatism, gout, rickets, uh, scrofula, and tuberculosis, and was said to be suitable for treating both adults and children. Yep. But despite the health benefits of cod liver oil, one thing was preventing it from being a household remedy, and that was because it had an extremely offensive taste and odor. So up until 1853, um, the method for preparing cod liver oil involved mixing the oil with a great number of decomposition products, giving the final product to have a distinctly unpleasant flavor and smell, and some people would even vomit after consuming it. So the extraction process uh, need to be greatly improved, and it was by the introduction of a steam process where pure oil was obtained from the livers instead. And drinking of it, drinking it was manageable, but the after effects, the nauseating after effects still persisted due to the presence of um, previously unknown compounds from the oil that would oxidize in the extraction process. And this was, this was not until there was a new method of cod liver oil preparation that came about which completely removed uh, any form of oxidization from, oxidation from taking place. So um, cod liver oil could then be produced on a large scale enough to be commercialized. Um, so yes, one of the people who was experimenting with these new methods of extraction was Alfred B. Scott, um, together with his business, business partners, uh, Samuel W. Brown. He, they created the firm Scott & Bound to sell their product known as Scott's Emulsion, which took a European remedy to America and created a cod liver oil that was uh, very importantly, as palatable as milk. So um, the appeal of Scott's emulsion was encapsulated in their first registered trademark in 1879, which was perfect, permanent, and palatable. So the formula for Scott's emulsion included glycerin to coat the oil, making the emulsion impossible to separate and was permanent in the sense that um, it wasn't able to separate while adding a sweetness to the drink. And with this focus on palatability, Scott's emulsion succeeded in its so-called perfect formula and by the 1890s, it was being exported throughout the Americas, Europe, and Asia. So this is where Singapore comes in. Um, although Scott's emulsion entered the Singaporean market around the 1880s, and you can see um, on the left picture is an advertisement report in 1888, um, its success in Singapore was not actually immediate. So due to the geographic location of Singapore, most children here didn't suffer from rickets, which was what cod liver oil was most famously used for. Um, so how exactly did Scott's emulsion become popular? So there are several other external factors in the 1940s and 50s that contributed to Scott's emulsion's rise, rising popularity. And most prominently was the high rate of infant mortality and tuberculosis, um, as well as a growing trust people had for the Scott's emulsion formula and brand. So in the 1940s and 50s, tuberculosis was rampant in Singapore and was a major cause of death at the time. Um, as cod liver oil had been known to treat diseases such as tuberculosis, Scott's emulsion was one of the remedies people sought after in order to keep tuberculosis at bay. Newspaper articles would then describe how as a preventative measure for tuberculosis, Scott's emulsion was given to patients of all ages and it stated that it was chosen because they were satisfied of the excellence of the oil used in the manufacture. People trusted that the Scott's emulsion formula was helpful in curing and preventing tuberculosis and in 1955, the Borneo Company, which were the distributors of Scott's Emulsion then, um, reported that 80,000 gallons of Scott's Emulsion were sold in Singapore and Malaya. Um, they attributed the sales to the huge part Scott's Emulsion had to play in improving public health and eradicating mass killers such as tuberculosis. Thus, Singer, uh, Scott's Emulsion solidified its reputation as a reliable medicine and 
um, very importantly, a service to society. Um, infant mortality in Singapore was also a major problem during the mid 20th century. So in the 1950s, the Singapore infant mortality rate was approximately 68.59 deaths per 1,000 life births. And this is a drastic difference from, let's say, like the 2018 infant mortality rate of about 1.61 deaths per 1,000 life births. And this made children's health and well-being one of the biggest concerns for Singaporean mothers at the time. Um, but in 1949, the UNICEF um, Executive Direct Director Maurice Pate announced that UNICEF would be providing a long-term benefit program um, one of which included shipping over 3 million pounds of cod liver oil from Canada and New Zealand to various parts of Asia. And by this point, cod liver oil was recognized to be a legitimate supplement for children to boost their immunity. And this gave an increased trust in uh, the health benefits of cod liver oil. So around the same time, several cod liver oil health supplements were being advertised to pregnant women and mothers in Singapore. One of these supplements um, being Scott's Emulsion. And several articles at the time described Scott's emulsion as an ideal medicine for children, claiming that as your child grows, Scott's emulsion called liver oil um, content will supply the necessary vitamins A and D. So the articles also claimed that with the Scott's emulsion formula, babies would take the cod liver oil not only easily, but happily. Um, as an affordable and trusted product, Singaporean mothers depended on Scott's emulsion as a reliable way to boost their children's immunity and further establish itself as a brand for mothers and children. And building on that narrative, Scott's Emotion, um, as a, building on the narrative that Scott's Emotion was a service to society, the Borneo company took advantage of these contexts to portray their, both its company and Scott's Emotion as a reliable product for the sake of public health. So you can see that the Borneo company actively engaged in charitable effort, efforts, such as in 1949, where they donated $5,000 worth of Scott's Emotion to Singapore's Ramakrishna Mission of Orphanage. Um, acts like this boosted Scott's Emulsion's reputation by portraying the distributors of Scott's Emulsion as a company that cared for the community and also established Scott's Emulsion as a beneficial health product that can act as a service to others. So this allowed Scott's Emulsions to, to earn the trust and attention of the public and gain a competitive advantage over the other health supplements and fish oil brands that were also in the market at the time. So yes, with this solid foundation, uh, in its popularity established around in the 1940s and 50s, Scott's Emulsion strengthened their consumer base through the use of targeted advertising and developed its brand through its original, through its original formula. So the Scott's Emulsion's advertisements not only emerged in newspapers, but also were featured in various other media. From the 1950s onwards, uh, Scott's Emulsion's advertisements were featured in school magazines. Here you can see one from St. Andrew's School Magazine um, and Household Calendars. So once television also became popularized around the 1980s, uh, Scott Emulsion created several commercials, both in Mandarin and English, for the new orange flavored version of Scott Emulsion, known as Scott Emulsion Orange. Um, so yes, uh, Scott Emulsion Orange distinguished itself from the original flavor um, and formula by making cod liver oil even more palatable and thus more appealing to children. Today, the Scott company has expanded their product range beyond cod liver oil emulsions to continue appealing to children's tastes, um, creating fish oil and vitamin C gummies to further attract the attention of children and portray themselves as a kid-friendly brand. Scott has also created mascots which will interact with children during events and have promotions to include educational toys or school supplies such as pencil cases and torch lights when parents bought a bottle of Scott's Emulsion. So yes, moving on to the second question I aim to explore when I first started this project on whether the act of taking Scott's emotion could be considered a form of cultural memory. So using Jan Asman's concept of cultural memory, I found that the act of taking Scott's emotion in one's childhood is significant in creating a cultural memory for three reasons here. Uh, firstly, because it has the ability to create a collective identity through the shared experience of children who have consu consumed Scott's emotion in their childhood. Number two, because there's a desire and a capacity to be reconstructed in different households over time. And number three, because there's an organizational structure to it in the form of a parent or guardian and child social relationship that repeats this process. Um, so just for a definition, Asman uh, defines cultural me memory to be a collective concept for all knowledge that directs behavior and experience in the interactive framework of a society and one that obtains through generations in repeated societal practice and initiation. So um, Asman uses this concept to describe 
cultural practices such as religion, which can be more distinctive in recognizing people's behaviors and experience. But I believe that this can also be useful uh, when applied to the, the use of commercial products like Scott's Emulsion, um, despite the ambiguity of people considering it um, as an explicit formative part of their identity, identity or as an influence on their behaviors. So I guess diving deeper into these reasons, um, Scott's Emulsion creates a collective identity as there's a community or group which derives an awareness of its unity or peculiarity. Um, yes, so with a tangible product like Scott's Emulsion, um, it's easy to distinguish between people who have had it and people who have not. It's just whether they bought the product or not. But the true key in forming a collective identity, I believe is the vivid memory and shared experience of children having consumed Scott's Emulsion as a regular part of their childhood. Um, I conducted a small, quite informal survey among 15 Singaporean participants of college age who did consume Scott's Emulsion in their childhood. And 14 of them said that it was a regular part of their life, at least up until primary school. Many of them also recalled their emotional reactions taking it, which ranged from disgust and reluctance to enjoyment. And the nature of the product also requires it to be a regular part in one's childhood routine, forming a sort of daily ritual that incorporates Scott's Emulsion. For those that had it in their childhood, this experience can be a relatable one and allows for people to forge bonds and, ident and identities with each other and establish a norm. Um, I believe that this also manifests in other ways, such as the incorporation of Scott's Emulsion uh, in popular culture, as this is evidence of how Scott's Emulsion has managed to embed the Scott's brand into the Singaporean subconscious. So for example, people have begun to sell art of Scott's Emulsion. Um, up in the corner of this slide, you can see a sticker of the man with the fish on his back which is the symbol for Scott's Emulsion, or um, this retro style vintage poster that's being sold on Etsy. So yeah, it embodies a certain like nostalgic feeling that people have for Scott's Emulsion. And another example of how Scott's Emulsion is embedded in popular culture, uh, even if it isn't specifically Singaporean, I found it very interesting um, how other Asian contexts also um, talk about Scott's Emulsion is in Prita Samarasan's book, Evening is the Whole, is the whole Day. So where the character Uma is an extraordinary child who is pampered with Scott's Emulsion. So yes, the association of Scott's Emulsion in other Asian contexts to popular brands such as Fisher-Price toys, Ladybird clothes, or like Bali malt, um, and these treats in indicate that Scott's Emulsion holds some sort of prestige and is also associated with nurturing exceptional children. Um, according to Asman, cultural memory can also be reconstructed over time and each contemporary context gives the objectivized meaning into its own perspective and gives its own relevance. So in the case of Scott's Emulsion, this has proven to be true in both the ease in which Scott's Emulsion has evolved over time and in the way it can have different levels of significance in each household. In today's context, neither tuberculosis nor infant mortality in Singapore is as significant an issue as it was back in the 1940s or 50s. Yet the presence of Scott's Emulsion in children's lives still persists. Um, in fact, the dynamic changes that Scott's has made to improve their brand, such as the different flavors and forms of Scott's Emulsion, allows for new generations to form a different relationship with Scott's Emulsion. As a product that can be easily be found in any supermarket or drugstore, the routine of taking Scott's Emulsion in any household can also be easily replicated while allowing each household to have their own unique way in which they practice it, be it the time of day that the child drinks it or the person who feeds it to them. The current generation of parents also show a desire to recreate this practice as can be seen on the multiple parent forums and groups that I managed to find. Uh, Scott's Emulsion thus remains to be a trusted brand uh, amongst adults. But exactly how does that affect children? So um, organization in relation to the concept of cultural memory, memory refers to how practices are communicated and how those that bear a cultural memory are cultivated. As a product targeted and mother for their children, one of the unique aspects of the Scott's Emotion experience is that many children feel obligated to drink it because of their parents. So from my survey, approximately 92% of the participants said that they drank Scott's Emotion purely because their parent or guardian told them to do so. And despite half of them being unsure of the health benefits that it had, um, they still did it. Thus, the expected ritual of taking Scott's Emotion uh, comes from a very interesting dynamic of parent or guardian to child rather than the child themselves choosing to partake in it. Um, here are just some of the interesting responses I received when I asked uh, my participants whether they thought Scott's Emotion had any health benefits or whether they had any fond memories of it. Uh, but in summary, Scott's Emotion has managed to evolve in a way that remains both relevant and mundane. 
In other words, Scott's emotion has become a cultural memory that stemmed from legitimate health concerns in the past, but persists today in a combination with a Singaporean attitude of kiasuism. So although it's a seemingly mundane activity of taking a daily vitamin, uh, it's interesting to see how these actions got incorporated into people's everyday lives. And for some people, Scott's emotion is one of the many symbols of their childhood. And it's an act that is rooted in long gone health concerns, concerns that were extremely pressing in the past. Um, by understanding the humble origins of cod liver oil and how Scott's emulsion was popularized in Singapore, we can understand the factors that led to Scott's emulsion to become a cultural memory in the Singaporean subconscious. In this way, Scott's emulsion was, has successfully continued to be a fond and common household product in Singapore, as well as a cultural symbol for many. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. That was a really fans, um, fascinating presentation about, you know, health foods as big business and how they become part of our popular culture and collective memory. So next up, we have um, Mr. Elliot Ong talking about fish mall. Um, and Elliot is an environmental studies graduate with experience in a diverse range of wildlife conservation projects. He's particularly interested in sustainable food chains and the wildlife trade, which has led him to delve deeper into the fish maw trade, as well as its cultural significance. Um, the stage is yours. Okay, let me just share my screen. Okay. Everyone can see my screen, right? Um, all right. So today I'll be talking about Fishmore and the past and present, how it's changed over the years. So I think today we've seen a lot of different local dishes that are more familiar to us also, like Sambal Stingray or Lala. Um, but Fishmore is something that occupies a particular place in our society. It might not be as popular, but it has um, a certain cultural significance to it. Um, sorry. Yeah, so I just want to talk a bit more about how I got started looking at Fishmore. So um, as an environmental studies student, I looked a lot at legal and illegal wildlife trade. And one of the best places to look at um, wildlife products was TCM shops, so traditional Chinese medicine shops. Um, I started off looking at Saiga antelope pond. So this is legally traded in Singapore, but it belongs to a critically endangered species of antelope. And while I was at the TCM stores, I noticed that there's a lot of other products, especially um, stuff that we use in cooking that had medicinal benefits. And in particular, I was attracted to um, a certain category of uh, food products, which was highly prized dried seafoods. Now in uh, Chinese culture, there are four main highly prized dried seafoods. Uh, one is fish maw, um, then you have sea cucumber, abalone, and shark's fin. Um, from my own uh, perspective, these were really interesting to me because when we look at these highly prized um, seafoods, there is the high potential for um, over harvesting because this encourages fishermen to really over harvest um, certain fisheries because of the high demand and high price of the products. And I decided to delve deeper into this because um, we discussed um, food as a method of inquiry this morning. And food is a great way to kind of realize the cultural significance and also the historical importance of these goods. And this helps us um, come up with strategies to tackle um, sustainable fisheries. So um, to understand why fish more is so important and highly prized, we first have to look at um, the interaction between Chinese food and medicine. Now in Chinese culture, and this is not specific to Chinese culture, food and medicine is not, is inseparable. So they both um, are linked together. Um, food is seen as having medicinal benefits, even things that we eat from day to day, like chicken soup, um, every, even fruits have a certain kind of heatiness um, associated with it. And I'm quite sure as Singaporeans, we are very aware of this uh, term heatiness. So for fish more, um, it is seen as good for the skin because of the amount of collagen. It's also good for the lungs. So it helps with the respiratory health. Um, besides looking at this link between food and medicine, uh, we also have to take into account the Chinese palate. Now in Chinese cuisine, texture is as important as taste. And um, Chinese people generally appreciate textures that are considered unappealing by other cultures, generally um, Western cultures. So um, textures like sliminess, um, grisliness are things that are more sought after. 
Um, and fish maw definitely plays into that. So it's a very um, crunchy, rubbery texture. It also um, has a lot of like dents and grooves in it that are very good at absorbing gravy and um, soups. So this is a very unique flavor profile that is very hard to be replicated by other um, ingredients. Now, a lot of us um, are familiar with fish maw soup. I think this is the traditional way that you prepare fish maw. It's a very clean way. Um, this is the way that it's touted. Um, to be cooked in for the maximum medicinal benefits, but it's by no way um, the only way to prepare fish more. So looking through um, recipe books, these are my grandmother's uh, Chinese uh, cooking books, you'll see that the main um, way that fish more is um, prepared is braised and in a soup. So as I mentioned before, this is how fish more really absorbs the flavor of um, whatever it's cooked in but you can find it in fried um, varieties also and stuffed fish maw. I've even seen fish maw dumplings. Um, in the cookbooks, it's mainly um, used for braising and, and soups, but in restaurants, you find the wider um, variety. Now we're very familiar with what fish maw looks like um, when it's cooked, but do we actually know what it is? Um, so I actually got a fish from the market. Normally when you buy um, fish, you ask the fishmonger to gut it for you, but I asked him specifically not to gut it so I could actually um, find the swim bladder. Now, it's very easy to find. So if you cut your own fish, um, there's this pale um, kind of tubular organ inside that you can find, and that's the swim bladder. Um, it's an internal gas-filled organ um, that helps with the fish's buoyancy. So um, it helps it to stay afloat. And if a fish doesn't have a properly functioning swim bladder, it's basically gone, it can't survive. So it's a very important organ, a very um, simple organ. Uh, it is normally thrown away as a waste product, but in Chinese culture, it's revered. Um, how it's processed, it's either dried or fried. Now, dried varieties are generally more expensive than fried varieties because this preserves the texture better. Fried varieties are seen as a very convenient, quick way to process the fish more. Um, it's generally lower grade. So that's why dried varieties are more expensive. Um, why is it so priced? Um, we talked about the medicinal properties. Um, so this is a big part of it. It also has a very unique texture. We mentioned that. And also, um, most importantly, it's seen as a luxury good. It's something like a status symbol. So for example, you want to spoil your loved ones with food or you want to impress your business partners. It's, the, it's one of the best ways to do that because it's well known as this uh, status symbol. Has it always been priced? The short answer is yes. So fish more... Uh, was first recorded as the emperor's favorite dish in the 7th century. He enjoyed it um, as, as like steamed and coated in honey, which is not how we eat it nowadays. So you can see there's a huge change in how we eat it uh, until now. Looking at it in a more local context, in 1947, there were already records of huge amounts of fish maw being traded in Singapore. Singapore has historically been a very important port for the trade of fish maw alongside other seafood. Uh, Penang and Malacca were also listed as important ports of trade, uh, uh, along with Hong Kong. Back then, uh, fish more already cost a lot, 250 to 480 Singapore dollars on average. So you can imagine how much that um, is valued at now. Uh, most interestingly, it was used to generate US dollars for the economy. So how this was done is fish more was sold to the US and the US dollars were basically used to boost Singapore's economy. Um, why the US bought it was uh, firstly, well, there's a huge Chinese population in the US. Um, they obviously consume fish maw. But fish maw is also used in a lot of other things. Um, the Western term for fish maw is, is in glass. Now, these were used for a variety of different things. It could be used to make glue. It's used in the clarification of um, a lot of products. It was used to brew beer. Um, it, before pork gelatin was used to make um, jellies and gummies, fish maw was used. Um, interestingly, it was also used to make condoms. Um, and then in the 1970s and 80s, if you look through the newspapers, um, you can see in a lot of the special menus and banquets, uh, fish maw is regularly featured there. Um, and it really speaks to the luxury status of this food item. So I was like looking at it and I was um, thinking, wow, this is a luxury food item. But one day I was at a food court and I saw this store, it's called Guan's Mipo. You, you guys might have seen it. Um, and they were offering bowls of uh, Mipo with Fish more. Now, Mipo is a very cheap hawker dish. Um, and this hawker store decided to use fish more to like kind of elevate um, their Mipo. It was still cheap. And so I was wondering, 
how are they managing to do this if it's a luxury item? So I said to myself, maybe the status of fish more and the significance has changed over time. So I decided to look at um, what are the modern, what's the modern significance of fish more? Best place to do this is at Albert Center Market. So this is um, a very, well, it's probably the biggest market for sun-dried and dried seafood goods in Singapore. You have an entire second level um, of shops, uh, very old shops selling dried goods. So I, I went there and asked the store owners, I was like, um, so who are your main customers? And they told me, well, most of our customers are home cooks. And I was like, oh, so no restaurants buy them. I said, no, no restaurants don't normally come to us. I, I think restaurants don't really cook them. They only cook them if people buy them and request for them to cook. But I think that's not entirely true. I think restaurants actually buy them from wholesalers. And I looked online, Victoria Wholesale Market is where most of the restaurants um, get them from. Uh, I also went around and looked at the prices of the fish more to see if that has changed. Um, some were pretty cheap, but I asked the sauna, okay, so what's your most expensive fish more? And he brought out this, he weighed it for me. This is about 100 grams. Um, he said that for this particular fish more, it was $800 per kilo. So I was like, wow, that's expensive. So it still has that value that it had in the past, um, but it seems like there are more varieties of fish more available now. Um, I had a longer look around and you can see that there's a very huge diversity of prices. Um, for the one on the extreme left, it's, uh, it's one fish more, but costs $309. Then you get um, the smaller ones, um, the fried varieties for a lot less. Um, generally, the size of the more dictates the price. Um, and that is, goes according to species also. The larger species have larger malls, but you get some smaller species that have expensive malls. Um, if you look at the extreme right, that's about $407 for that small packet. Um, I also asked them where they got their fish more from. Um, a lot of them were unsure, but I managed to get um, some from online uh, sources, so the wholesalers, and also um, some interviews. Um, in the past, if you look at historical records, fish more came from these three locations. So Indochina, that means Vietnam, Cambodia, um, Myanmar, and the Malayan islands, so Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, and Bengal, and Sri Lanka. But nowadays, you get them from a bunch of different places that are all around the world. So uh, South America, South Africa, East Africa, and all the way from the USA and Mexico. So this has really diversified um, the kinds of fish more we're getting and has probably allowed for that change in um, the different prices as well. Um, the supply chain has also changed. Um, in the past, it was mainly Chinese fishermen who then who fished the fish more and then um, sold it to Chinese middlemen who exported it back for consumption. Nowadays, you get mainly local fishermen. So in East Africa, for example, you get Ugandans and Kenyans fishing for these fish, but they still sell it to Chinese middlemen who then export it or, or re-export it. Um, another thing that has also changed is the species of fish that have um, been ha um, harvested for fish more. So um, Theodore Cantor is a famous ichthyologist um, in the 19th century, and he documented back then 11 species that were used for fish more. Um, a lot of them are our local fish species. So um, you can see um, this, these are fish from Jurong Fish Report. Um, there's ikan kurao there. That's the, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but it's this fish here. And then you get uh, snappers and groupers. So these were all used um, to, for uh, all harvested for the more. Nowadays, you get at least 20 species. This was um, from some research that we've done and includes a lot of other species um, found all around the world. Uh, this is a table of um, the species that we've been looking at. You can see that the origin really spans the whole globe. Um, one of the challenges to really find out um, where these fish are coming, uh, what these fish are, is actually the trade names. So um, you can see some of them are like, uh, for example, the bottom one, now perch is sold as Huanghua fish also. And we're not really sure what fish that is. That's one of the difficulties um, we're, we're experiencing when it comes to finding out. But in general, you can see there's a huge, huger diversity of um, fish. And with that comes um, certain problems with it. Um, for example, the Nile perch um, is from East Africa. And right now the demand for fish more is so great that it is greater than the demand for the fish's um, flesh. So it's really changing um, how fishermen even fish for, for food. So before they would um, harvest, the, basically the primary product would be the fish, the flesh. 
and the byproduct would be the more. Nowadays, the more is the primary product, and they're even throwing away um, now like the flesh of the fish because uh, the demand for the more is so much greater uh, than for the fish that the fishermen can't even sell off the flesh anymore. Um, and this will have issues for sustainability, and that's why we're looking into um, how to better manage um, fish more fisheries. Um, for Toto Aba, this is from Mexico. It's probably the premium, it's the cream of the crop of fish more. It's the most expensive. Um, what has happened is actually they've been fished so much that they're really facing, they're critically endangered now, um, I think. And what's even more endangered is these small little um, dolphin-like animals called the vaquita. There's only 20 left. And this is because they're being caught along with the Toto Aba in these nets. Um, Fish more trade is also very interestingly often linked to uh, organized crime and um, drug cartels. And they're using this money um, from the fish more trade to actually finance their operations. So this is really like, they call it ocean cocaine. So as you can see, fish more has increased in price in some for some species to the point that it's being used to finance these organizations. And on the other side, you find them in meat pork dishes. So it's a very unique, um, change in, in the in the product. So what has changed? It's more accessible now because people um, are uh, becoming more um, financially able to like buy these products. The income levels have been increasing. Um, that also has increased the demand for these goods. Um, but for different types of species, um, the price has changed differently. So they're becoming more expensive, but at the same time cheaper according to the grade. Um, and as I mentioned before, the byproduct has uh, suddenly become a primary product. I think nothing uh, speaks better to the real change in fish more than this bowl of meepo. I think it really is a very striking image for me. It's like, wow, this once luxury good has now been used in other more simple dishes. And I think uh, we'll find it a lot more in home cooking in, in the years to come. Uh, what hasn't changed so much is that this fish more is still highly prized for its medicinal value. These values um, that are imbued in Chinese cooking are still very present now. Um, and I think it's a very unique part of our food heritage um, and people's desires as well to have something as a status symbol to eat more luxurious foods. So that hasn't changed um, over time. Yeah, so that uh, with that, I'll come to the end of my presentation. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, that was that was really interesting as well, kind of fish more and how it changes from this traditional delicacy to becoming like a global phenomenon involving so many different species um, and even developing into its own underground market with relations to criminality. I think that these are all, all a lot of things to chew on for the Q&A. Um, so thank you. Um, moving on, we're moving to the last uh, presentation. Uh, for this panel and also I, th I think for the workshop, uh, we've got Dr. Anthony Madrano who's talking about the men who knew so much living with medicinal plants at the Singapore Botanical Gardens. But first off, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Madrano. He is the National University of Singapore's Presidential Young Professor of Environmental Studies at Yale and US College where his teaching explores a history of human interactions with marine environments in Singapore and Southeast Asia. He is the author of The Edible Tide, How Estuaries and Migrants Transform the Straits of Malacca, which appeared in the Journal of Southeast Asian Studies. His first book manuscript titled The Edible Ocean, Science, Industry, and the Rise of Urban Southeast Asia is under contract with Yale University Press. He's also the principal investigator of the SSRC MOE funded project linking the digital humanities to biodiversity history in Singapore and Southeast Asia. Um, over to you, Anthony. All right, um, let's see. Uh, thanks so much for that, Faris. Um, I wanna thank you, I wanna thank our, my panel. I wanna thank um, all the presenters, the attendees, my current and former students, the NHB and Yale and US College um, for just supporting this, this really important and I think um, fun, fun workshop. So um, my talk today is about the generations of people who made a life out of plants while working and living at the Singapore Botanic Gardens. Um, I think I'm gonna do something very much like, not very much like, I'm gonna go a bit beyond medicine. Uh, I, I, medicinal plants are very much 
at the heart of this, but I think I'm gonna also go beyond that and think more about plants um, in, their, in their broader and perhaps cultural and social um, lives. So that's kind of, I just, that's a, that's a, uh, just a heads up. So it's about the men who knew so much, and that's a quote, um, as one source from 1979 put it. In part, I want to share um, some thoughts about how we might think with plants and in doing so, um, expand and enrich the story of Malayan flora in Singapore's botanical past. The need to expand the story of Malayan flora is around us via absences, silences, flattenings, and reductions in most historical plant narratives. What is visible, however, are the lives and legacies of Singapore Botanic Garden's European botanists. And here are just a few of them. We've got Ridley, Brookhill, and Holton. Their biographies have colonized Singapore's remarkable plant-based story. If you have time, hop on the 151 and tour today's Singapore Botanic Gardens. You'll find the names of some of these European um, botanists scattered across the built environment. There's Corner House, Brookhill Hall, Holton Hall, and Ridley Hall. Here we have Holtham Hall, which is today's um, Gardens uh, Heritage Museum. And in reviewing the opening of the museum in 2015, a popular study, uh, excuse me, a popular story made no mention of others beyond the same familiar European botanist, despite the story's title, History, Heritage and Honor. What's ahead then is my attempt to use plants medicinal, economic, rare, alien, and abundant as a way to write new voices, lives, and contributions into the story of Malayan flora and the Singapore Botanic Gardens in particular. So some of the ways in which we could expand the story of Malayan flora and the Singapore Botanic Gardens is by revisiting the following publications, expeditions, names, specimens, illustrations, and families. I'm gonna to try to do this quickly. And in doing so, I'm gonna bring um, uh, an individual's life, uh, a bit of their biography into the story as well. So let's start with publications. Publications are a great way to learn about the many folks who worked at or contributed to the Singapore Botanic Gardens over the years. On knowing medicinal plants, for example, there's probably no better starting point than um, Isaac Burkhill and uh, Mohammed Hanif's um, Malay Village Medicine, which was published in 1930. And so you've, you've got a, a picture of it there. And on the right, that's Mohammed Hanif. While we might know about Burkhill, um, can we say the same about Hanif? He was from Penang, director of the Penang Botanic Garden, and he died the same year that his important publication was, um, was, was published. Um, and it was while he was collecting plants. He also served in 1925 as the assistant curator of the Singapore Botanic Gardens. The author of his obituary stated that he had a, a quote, very extensive knowledge of Malayan flora. And that knowledge shows up both in visible and invisible ways. Uh, visibly, it's in this publication, Malay Village Medicine, um, which he largely um, did with the assistance of Burke Hill. Um, but it also shows up in Burke Hill's um, Dictionary of Economic Products of the Malay Peninsula, where um, a lot of the references to medicinal plants are derived from Hanif's work. His knowledge and expertise was crucial to the production of Malay Village Medicine, like I just mentioned, which contains more than 1,600 medicinal plant entries. The very plants that he collected um, form, in fact, an historical part of today's Singapore um, Botanic Gardens herbarium. And these are just two, um, two of the many that are available there. 
Um, we've got number 1515, which was for cracked feet, and number 458, which was um, for anxious women. But in another source, uh, Burkhill's dictionary, um, Burkhill references this, um, this plant as a stimulant to make elephants brave. So publications, an important place to find new ways to tell new stories. Um, like publications, expeditions are a great way to learn about the people who played a vital role in the work of the Singapore Botanic Gardens. One figure who jumps out because of his um, botanical travels was Kia bin Haji Muhammad Saleh, who worked at the gardens from 1920 to 1957. And those are his, um, his years of employment uh, there. In 1931, he was part of um, the Singapore Botanic Garden's first expedition to, the, to Mount Kinabalu. Um, and in 1930, just the year before, he collected plants in Siam as well as um, other parts of Southeast Asia, including Sumatra, um, Burma, and the various states of Malaysia. So we have a plant on the left uh, that, that Kia collected. It's a type specimen, which means it's the, it's the one that all other specimens use to um, reference or compare or to determine. Um, and on the right, we've got a picture of Kia um, ascending Mount Kinabalu in 1931. So publications, expeditions, um, names are also a great source of information and history about botanical work at the Singapore Botanic Gardens. One person who shows up through a survey of plant names is Cayetano um, Furtado. Furtado was born in Goa in 1897. Um, he joined the gardens in 1923. Um, he was an expert on palms um, he, and he received his PhD from the University of Bombay in 1939. Important for us, um, he was also a taxonomist. Uh, that is a person who describes and names plants, scientifically names plant, plants. Here we have Malayan plants that he named in honor of um, some of the garden's European botanists. Um, Corner on the left, uh, Henderson in the middle, and Ridley on the right. But he also named plants in honor of his Malay and Javanese Singapore Botanic Garden colleagues. Here we have plants in honor of Kia, the top left, um, from his trip to Mount Kinabalu, which I just spoke about, and Haji Muhammad Nur bin Muhammad Gauss um, uh, on the right and on the bottom. Names are attached to specimens, so specimens are also a rich way to expand the story of Malayan flora and um, the Singapore Botanic Gardens. On specimens, I wanna bring attention to the life and work of Nadayam uh, uh, bin Haji Ismail. Uh, Nadiam uh, was born in Singapore uh, along Scotts Road in 1904. Um, his father was a gardener at the gardens as well. Um, uh, he went to Tenglin um, Tingi Malay School before starting a career at the gardens in 1921. Um, he collected hundreds of plants for the gardens and, um, and worked for a long time as Singapore's first head ranger overseeing um, botanic reserves and later nature reserves. And these are just some plants that he was responsible for collecting. And the, the big one in the center was in fact named after him. It was both collected by him and named after him. Um, you might be more familiar with him because he was the individual who collected the monkeys for corner at the gardens. So um, publications, expeditions, names, illustrations. Illustrations too are great sources for thinking about or thinking with, um, thinking with plants and finding new histories about the people who shaped the visual culture, that is the visual epistemology to use Bleichmar's um, phrase and, and one that both Kathy Poe and Faris Jarami both uh, uh, really enjoy, um, and I do too. Um, Jarami really shaped uh, the visual epistemology of Malayan flora and the Singapore Botanic Gardens. 
And while no relation to, to Faris, uh, who is our moderator here, I'd like to look at the work of, of um, the garden's most prolific artist, Jarami bin um, Samsuri. Jarami was born in Singapore in 1923, and that's a picture of him up on the, the left. He was born in 1923 and attended Tinglin Basar Malay School and then later Victoria School. Um, Jarami joined the gardens in 1942, a time when the institution was under Japanese administration. Um, he was a swimmer and a diver at Victoria, winning medals in island-wide competitions, but it was his art um, seen here that communicated Malayan flora to the world. And what we've got here are just two examples um, on the one on the right, it's the big one. This is um, a, a illustration of an orchid and this actually forms a very important calendar that the gardens um, sells and gives out. And on the left, we've got a, um, a picture of a plant that, uh, that, that could be found in the gardens bulletin, the journal of the, um, of the Singapore Botanic Gardens. And, and it's worth pointing out that Jerome had hundreds of illustrations much like these and they're all available at the um, Singapore Botanic Gardens archive. Um, Drami though was also involved in, in, in illustrating plants that had specifically useful, economic, edible, medicinal um, values. Here we have a book called Common Malayan Plants, um, selected drawings. Those drawings are actually, they're drawings um, by Drami. Uh, this was a book, this is really a translation, um, an abbreviated translation uh, of a book that was developed during the Japanese period. Um, and Drami did all the drawings for that Japanese book or most of the drawings for that Japanese book. And when it was sort of picked up and, and, and translated um, in the 1950s, they just incorporated both Drami's original drawings as well as um, some of his newer drawings. So here we have a, um, a medicinal plant illustrated by Drami that shows up in common Malayan plants. And um, in addition though, we've got um, this book, Common Malayan Wildflowers. Uh, again, illustrations made by uh, Drami. These are um, again, a mix of edible herb and medicinal plants. Um, here we've got on the bottom, I'll just point out one of the plants that are noted in this, um, uh, these Drami illustrations, um, number D, which is the, the, the purplish flower um, on the bottom left. Uh, this was used for treating fish stings. And so it took a great deal of botanical skill to be able to illustrate um, these plants. Um, families, another important aspect. Finally, families, not only of flora, but also of people. Um, and these were really important. Families are an important resource um, for us to find, uh, find and populate new voices and lives into the story and history of the Singapore Botanic Gardens. The Singapore Botanic Gardens was in fact a living kampung, um, a living kampung where generations of garden staff lived and worked. Children grew up together, learned about botany, from experience, observation, and their intimate community of experts. They learned the names of plants in multiple taxonomies, in Malay, in English, and in sort of the scientific language, um, Latin names. Here we have um, Haji Muhammad Noor and his son Muhammad Shah on the left, both worked at the herbarium, as well as Haji Sidek and his father Haji uh, Kia on the right. Again, they too worked in the herbarium. Nineteen seventy nine was also the year. Oh, excuse me. Um, here it is. Ah, excuse me. I think we go to this one. So, um, I want to go now uh, to wrapping this up, um, and that's the conclusion. I wanna conclude with um, the year 1979 and a quick reflection Ahmad, on Ahmad bin Hassan. Um, but in 1979, an era ended at the gardens and so did a chapter in the story of Malayan flora. In 1979, Singapore Botanic Gardens Kampung, the one where all the families uh, lived 
and learned and developed their botanical expertise, or at least um, added to their botanical expertise. Uh, this compound was demolished in 1979, and its longtime families and residents were compelled to make new homes elsewhere. Some, like Haji Sidek, moved to the Clementi area, while others found flats in other parts of the island. 1979 was also the year that Ahmad bin Hassan passed away at the age of 100. Ahmad had joined the Singapore Botanic Gardens in the early 1890s. Um, he worked closely with Ridley and was responsible for creating a card system that indexed and mapped all the plants, medicinal and otherwise, within the grounds of the Singapore Botanic Gardens. Over the course of his, um, his life, he maintained a botanical dictionary that contained thousands of Malay, English, and scientific plant names, notes about these plants, as well as their medicinal, medicinal uses and his observations. Perhaps something like um, Burke Hill's dictionary. Upon his passing, his son said that this unpublished dictionary would be donated to the Singapore Botanic Gardens for future generations. And it's really from Ahmad's obituary that we get the title of my talk today. His obituary described him as, quote, the man who knew so much. So inspired by, um, excuse me, inspired by um, Ahmad's life and the lives of others who knew so much about, there we go, sorry. Inspired by Ahmad's life and the lives of others who knew so much about the botany and culture of Malayan flora, I've tried in this talk to elicit some of the methods and materials we might leverage or turn to, to expand and enrich the story of and pedagogy about medicinal and other plants in Singapore's history of botanical knowledge production. Thank you. And thank you so much, Anthony. That was a very moving um, and emphatic uh, presentation, actually, looking at very real kind of intergenerational uh, connections and how Singapore Botanic Gardens was more than just this kind of like leisurely venue or, or, or just a research uh, you know, institute of sorts. It was a community. Um, and also, uh, thank you for bringing uh, to uh, drawing it, attention to this largely forgotten uh, community of people, the local experts and local uh, labor that made uh, the work of Malayan botany possible uh, beyond just uh, the European figures that we're mostly uh, familiar with. So I guess it, we've come now to the question and answer session. Um, so I'd like to invite all the panelists back on. Uh, you should all turn on your screens. Um, is uh, Dr. Faiz are there? Oh, there you are. Okay, great. So um, we've got uh, quite a number of questions here. Not not fifty three like the first panel. We've got just over a dozen. So so we've got a more manageable bunch. Um, I guess we can start now. Uh, there are two individuals here um, who are who have questions for. I'll, I'll group them together because they're really kind of talking about the same thing. This is uh, mainly for Dr. Faiza. Uh, first. So um, someone, uh, someone's asking, what's the difference between Indonesian Jammu and Malay medicine? That's the first part. Uh, and secondly, it's interesting to note the similarity of the notions of hot and cold to Chinese medicine, and also the idea of angin. Uh, there's a practice in Taoism that involves drinking water with ashes from burnt talisman. So maybe you could also comment between kind of these parallels between Chinese uh, traditional medicine and Malay folk remedies. Um, yeah, sure. Just a uh, just brief comment. I think these are great questions, and actually, the sort of uh, motivation for the project that Michael Sennebaker and I are um, embarking on, just to investigate, I think, the connections between um, Chinese and Malay medical traditions. The uh, commonalities, I think, um, lie in the fact that um, 
these traditional medical traditions and not just Chinese and Malay, but also other traditions um, are based on a kind of common philosophy of humoral medicine. And um, that's where sort of the conceptualization of angin, hot and cold, I think comes from articulated in different ways in different medical traditions. And I think what um, becomes different in each local tradition is the use of um, local plants, as well as the um, ways in which the ideas about humoral medicine become translated through local religions. So in that sense, um, the similarities, I think, between um, the work that you've pointed out, I think um, those are really interesting, especially with regards to the talisman. Um, I think that those sort of similarities um, stem from both a sort of common religious influence as well as a common philosophical um, framework for thinking about um, traditional medicine. So with regards to Indonesian and Malay as well, um, the differences I think um, that I see, at least I have not sort of systematically studied, I think the differences between um, the sort of recipes for Jamo and recipes for Malay medicine that have come across, but it does seem that they use different herbs. And I think Japanese turmeric is, I think, one of the biggest um, example of herbs that are often used in Indonesian Jamo. You don't find them in um, many manuscripts at all. So again, we come back to the idea of locality of rooting each medical tradition within the botanical um, complex that's um, associated with a place itself. And place is important in um, tradition. Mm. I suppose then, we can, uh, th there's this uh, other question that, that ties in very nicely to this, and this is by Liz uh, Chi, uh, who was with us yesterday. Uh, and, and this is also for Anthony as well, you can jump in. Um, because you were talking about how these different plant species are used by different communities, even in the local. So Liz is asking whether the herbs mentioned in your presentations were widely used, not just within the Malay community, but uh, by other um, ethnic or cultural groups as well. Uh, in their, you know, kind of like uh, medicinal systems. Uh, should I start or shall Anthony start? Yeah. I, I, you, <laughs> do you want to go first, Anthony? Maybe uh, I don't know. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I can I can speak briefly yeah. to that because yeah. I I kind of was tracing a a little bit of a different kind of knowledge story. Mm. Um, but what I would say is that the references that I was coming across um, when they talked about Malayan wildflowers or Malayan plants they did say that they were common in villages. They didn't specify that they were Malay villages, um, but they did say that they were, you know, if this is a common herb found in, in villages, something like that. Um, I would assume they were Malay villages because they would provide the Malay name, but it's, it, you know, one doesn't want to sort of assume a kind of cultural, ho I don't know, uh, homogeneity or something like that, some, some sort of, you know, assumed yeah. landscape. But I would say, uh, in some of the ones that I, I shared, they were um, they were common in villages. Yeah, I would assume assume wide use, but but I don't know for certain. Right. Um, I think in terms of common herbs that's being used, um, it's a bit difficult to say. Partly because I think that it depends on how. <laughs> Whether you see the families of herbs being for example, ginger having different sort of variants in different parts of the world, right? Would that be, um, should we say they're using the same um, thing? And one is, are they being used for the same condition? So what I sort of noticed is that, for example, if you compare um, recipes for eye wash or cleaning out your eyes for in both Pranatha medicine and Chinese medicine, you don't find common ingredients. So if you are trying to kind of find matching recipes across traditions, as far as I could tell, at least from those that have examined, um, it's difficult to say. And it's part of what, well, again, I'm sorry I keep plugging this project, but again, uh, I it's think a great project. To, to build is a kind of tool that encourages this sort of uh, linguistic cross comparison. And I think we don't have that yet, therefore it's hard for, for us to answer. But some things, that are widely circulated, that you know has been, there has been a long tradition of trade in it for things like pamper, that comes up in a lot of different medical rece mm. uh, recipes across different traditions. And I think right. the transnationality of the, the, the herb is, is kind of the push factor rather than the yeah. um, sort of um, linkage to specific conditions. Can, yeah. I, can I, I add something please. really quick? Um, Faris, I'm sorry. I just no, want to maybe suggest to, to Liz um, where I did see some overlap, and it was just kind of coming to me, the Malay Village Medicine um, uh, publication that that um, that Hanif um, co-authors, really authors, uh, it it was after 
a similar one that was done on Chinese medicines, looking at Chinese pharmacies. And in both cases, this is like 1920s, early 1930s. In both cases, they're using Latin scientific names of, of plants. So you can sort of cross reference, but I think the, you know, whether those Latin names are in fact um, exact or are they approximations? I mean, this is kind of the, the trickier thing. This is why one would want to go to the botanic gardens and actually you can look at the specimen and decide. But yeah, the, there are these two publications, one's Chinese medicine, one's Malay medicine, and both, um, both use Latin uh, names for the plants, which would, I haven't looked at that, but that would be a way to, to see if there's overlap or communication. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, that's interesting in itself, right? Because you've got, sorry, uh, were, you, were you going to say something? No, I said, I said, I don't do that. Could you check out the Kew Gardens database of plants? I think you can right. see yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, what's interesting is that, you know, the Latin taxonomical system becomes kind of like a mediating uh, language to bridge between these two traditions. And because of the nature of how the British constructed these sources, we think they're closed systems of knowledge, when in fact your research shows that there's actually a lot of, you know, uh, cross pollination and, and and parallels between them. Um, yeah. Um, so another comment from Liz, and this is for Kimberly. Um, apparently, her father is seventy one years old, uh, Singaporean, and was introduced to Scott's liver oil from a young age, and is still taking it daily. He attributes his perfect eyesight to Scott's. Uh, she has three questions. Um, let me see how we can do this. Um, well, so. Um, Based on your research, how scientific is the is the claim the nut of the nutritional health benefits of cod liver oil? Um, what's the difference between cod liver versus other fish, um, and how does the company sustain its production um, because of depleting cod populations? Okay, sure. Uh, I guess I'll tackle them one by one. Yeah. Um, so on the first question, uh, thanks, Doctor Lucy, for this question. Um, when I was doing my research, a lot of the scientific papers that I found um, did support that cod liver oil is actually full in vitamin A, D, and has um, really good um, amounts of omega-3 fatty acids. But from my understanding, I believe that because it's a health supplement, it's like not necessary to take it to sustain these things. I'm very impressed by your father, though. It's just like to continuously take it for so long. Uh, my mom also takes um, cod liver oil in a tablet form and she says it's good for her skin, but I, I don't know how true that is. Um, on your second question about the difference between cod liver oil and other fish, um, I don't think I've read too deeply into this, but from my understanding is that um, I think shark liver oil does also contain omega-3 um, fatty acids, but they don't have similar vitamin content and they're used for different things. Um, I can't remember if shark liver oil is used more for like cancers or tumors uh, and things like that versus cod liver oil used for more um, of the vitamin side. But yeah, that's like something that I would definitely love to dig into deeper. For the third question, given that cod is not as abundant in the past, um, yeah, this was a question that I really wanted to ask Scott. So I was like, trying to find a representative to talk to um, during the search and was unable to find one, unfortunately. Um, but my own guesses, if I were to think about how they would sustain its production, is either in the form of synthetic uh, vitamins. Um, I would think that they could find alternatives to uh, omega-3 sources. Um, but other than that, yeah, this was the question that I really, really wanted to ask because I didn't have a clear idea of where exactly Scott was getting their cod supply from, like what farms they were using, whether they were, you know, even using wild cod. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for the questions. I would love to deep, deep, dig deeper into them. If anyone else has any other suggestions or ideas, I would love to hear them too. Yeah. I mean, if there are any attendees here who, who have any insights, do jump in in the Q&A box. Uh, leave your comments. Um, this is a question for Elliot uh, by Chi Cheng Lim. Um, well, he's asking which kind of fish produces the most expensive more. I think you talked about that. I think the, the totoaba is probably the one globally that's like most highly prized. Um, hold on, where did that go? Uh, um, there's a follow-up. Oh, and um, He's also asking, this uh, Chi Cheng Lin is also asking about what is it that 
differentiates the, between the cheap and expensive one? What, what determines the grade? Is it differences in medicinal value? Um, and, and how is that measured? Yeah, so great question. Um, there are different grades of fish, you are absolutely correct. Um, those that are better um, preserved, for example, I was talking about the dried versus the fried ones. Um, they're deemed to have better textures. Um, they retain the medical, uh, the medicinal uh, benefits better. That's, that's what they're touted as. Um, that's how they sell it. Um, normally, the bigger moors, they have uh, the tendency to retain the texture a lot better. Um, the fried ones and the smaller moss, they tend to dissolve a lot easier in um, soups and things. So people tend to go, I mean, if they want um, the maximum medicinal benefits, if they can afford it, they go for the more expensive ones. Um, when we're talking about the species, those that are most highly valued, um, they will be the bigger uh, fish and also those that are rarer. So because of the high demand for some of these species, they're very, very rare. So, I mean, simple economics. So if there's a scarcity of the fish, the price will go up. Um, so there's also this other species besides the totoaba. It's called the Chinese bahaba. So that's the original, um, like, high-grade fish maw, but they've been almost fished to extinction. So that, I think, a few years back sold for a few hundred thousand dollars for a, sing a single maw. So I think that one's probably the most expensive that I've seen, at least. Mm, right. Okay. Um, probably a straightforward, a relatively more straightforward one. Um, for Anthony, someone is um, asking, Maddie Tham asks, is the card system developed by Encik Hassan Archive in Botanic Gardens, along with his dictionary, unpublished dictionary and notes? Uh, and this goes on, uh, this, this ties in very nicely with uh, Yap Wan Tim, who asks whether this un there are plans to turn this unpublished dictionary into you know, a, a publication. Hmm. Um, yeah, good question. I, I don't know if there's plans to publish it, and I don't know if it's still, in fact, there, or if it's, I imagine that it is, um, um, and I'm in touch with their head librarian, and um, so, uh, but I haven't actually asked about, about the, the dictionary. Um, I was, um, it was, it was other material that I was following up on. So I would say that um, I hope that the dictionary is there in their archives, which they have a huge, a sort of very rich one. Um, I think it's a, it's a question that probably can easily be answered by, by getting in touch with the, the, the gardens uh, without question. Dr. Noura is the, um, is the, the head librarian there. She runs the director of the library. Um, and then the other question that you asked was about, um, the card system? Yeah, so whether, whether Inchi Hassan's card system uh, has been archived. Uh, it has, yeah. yeah. That's right. Oh. Those, those materials are there. Um, so the cards are there. And the map that, that was created, that he created, uh, basically of all the, the tree, all the plants, um, this is also archived at the, uh, at the SBG. Um, and in many ways, informs later developments, uh, you know, with changes and yeah. what happens, but that's kind of the, that's the template. This was, it was with him and under him that, um, that this started, this kind of let's index what we have in the garden um, in a, in a wow. kind of comprehensive, comprehensive way. Right. I actually have a question for, for Dr. Faiza, um, because you mentioned that the over-the-counter the, the off, over medicines first start to show up uh, in Saudara, right? And we know that Saudara was, uh, was first started by a community of, of Islamic modernist thinkers who were urging the Malay community to kind of like uh, adopt modern scientific and rational uh, met, uh, you know, science and things like that. So do you think there's any connection between kind of these more modern medicinal systems coming in uh, through a, a, a newspaper like Saudara that you know, had very clear ideological leanings? So yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. I, I didn't mean to imply that it was the earliest publication that had. Right. Been. Okay. Um, um, I don't know if it's the earliest publication. It's definitely one of the early ones. Um, but yes, I think the interesting um, linkage they point out between modernizing and adopting a kind of over-the-counter medicine um, as a as an alternative to traditional medicine um, is a very interesting one. But I think that. Um, What's interesting is that something like Al-Imam, which I sort of briefly skimmed through, doesn't have so much 
all these sort of medical advertisements. So what I suspect was happening was actually was more related to the um, proximity to the team industry, actually. Um, ah. And it's the way in which uh, Penang, of course, being close to Ipoh Pira, and a lot of the advertisement comes from medical halls um, based in Ipoh. And uh, part of the reason why there was such an active sort of patent medicine, um, over-the-counter medicine tradition there was because of the needs for two minors and the way in which the sort of Chinese medical hall model replicated itself across the world. Wow. So, right. so that's, that's, a, that's a different story. But, and yeah. I think um, part of the reason for the sort of demise of female authority in terms of the um, in terms of um, the propagation of traditional medicine as well has to do with the way in which this model is very much a male dominant mm. model. So that's something uh, that maybe it's not, doesn't quite belong in this workshop, but uh, yeah, we're definitely worth thinking about. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks for the question, it's a, it's a great observation. Right, we've still got some time. I guess this leading up from that, I could ask uh, Kimberly and Elliot, because what I think is interesting is that both of your talks kind of dealt with fish as medicine. Um, but one became this kind of like super profitable, internationally kind of like recognized, like superstar health food. Um, but with fish more, you kind of, it still remains a largely very traditional uh, remedy and it's still, you know, sold um, like that. And like, I don't know, I mean, either if you could comment on like, why do you think uh, this is so, like, how is it that cod liver, this European kind of like, uh, you know, thing kind of be became an international phenomenon, whereas uh, fish more um, kind of globalized, but not quite in the same way. It didn't become this profitable, like big farm, big, big medicine kind of uh, business. Um, um, yeah. Maybe Elliot, you can go first. So I think it's um, to do with how people view like West Western science versus traditional um, forms of medicine. Um, Fishmore is very well respected by, I mean, the older generation, right? Those that really um, bought, not bought into, but really believed in traditional medicinal systems. Whereas I guess um, our parents' generation, when they started growing up, that was when Western medicine and science started getting introduced um, around the world, not just Singapore. And um, that really hasn't translated um, into, like, for, I mean, for traditional medicine, like if we look at, even like Western scientific journals, they very rarely look into um, the benefits of traditional um, herbs, uh, mm. food ingredients and, and remedies. They're starting to, I think um, they're starting to incorporate uh, more of these traditional uh, medicinal systems into their, their research, but it's, it's very new. And um, once that right. starts, I think they'll realize that there is a lot of knowledge and there is a lot of benefit in looking at um, all of these like traditional Chinese medicine or uh, Malay medicine also. Um, yeah, and hopefully uh, we'll get a lot more research um, in, in that field. All right, all right. Yeah, I think just adding on to that, uh, I completely agree with Elliot. I just think that another factor that was really important at the time was the kind of media that was being consumed at the time. So like, especially the newspapers articles that I saw, um, many of the articles were talking about the tuberculosis issue and at the bottom they will be like, and that's why you should drink Scott's Emulsion. Like it's a very... It was a very prescriptive kind of way. Um, and um, I guess to a certain extent, choice editor to think that these are reliable and prestigious ways mm -hmm. of um, you know, um, remedying the issues. Uh, and yeah, just like basically um, the, the kind of um, prestige that Western medicine has is definitely a lot more significant than it is for traditional medicine. And I guess like mm. there's that novelty also at the time um yeah generally it's just like the the sentiment of what's popular in that time is very dependent on its media i feel right yeah well that's kind of interesting as well how kind of like our perceptions of medicine and health are also shaped by uh, you know, the visual culture media mass media uh, things like that um I, I guess that kind of speaks to again like with with dr Feis, i guess this kind of the modernization of medicinal practice kind of you, you're, you're in a society where you've got, you know, print culture and mass media that's able to also facilitate um, support for, you know, more branded medicine, I suppose, as opposed to the traditional uh, remedies. Um, uh, another pretty uh, straightforward question for Kim, do you have any idea how much a bottle of Scott's Emulsion cost in the 50s? Um, how, 
you know, how far did the general population afford that, bearing in mind how most people in Singapore in the past were not very affluent? Uh, that's a really good question. Unfortunately, I do not know. Um, I dug through many, many different advertisements from the newspaper archives. Um, and it seems like they don't really document or put the prices of like the bottle. But seeing as how common it was to define in a newspaper, I would assume that it was affordable. But then again, I'm also not completely sure who the demographic of like the English reading population was at that time and like what kind of class they were from. Um, but yes, that's a really interesting question. I wish yeah. I also knew. Sorry, can I can I just chime in here? Um, I, yes, I, please, Jeff. I, I don't mean to intrude, but um, uh, I, I I was really uh, quite quite struck by by the parallels between uh, Kim's presentation on on these sorts of um, um, packed uh, nutrient packed oils and um, this other history of um, of of palm oil in our region. And um, one of the things about uh, the palm oil that we have today is that it's extremely refined, but in the past. Um, there were a lot of plans within the colonial administration um, to produce a cheaper alternative to cod liver oil, because cod liver at the time, um, I, I don't know if you if you mentioned this, Kim, but um, within I think some of the child welfare centers in Singapore and perhaps KL, they were actually trying to distribute um, cod liver oil to to families in need, but because it it was felt to cost too much, they started using red palm oil instead as a, as a supplement. Um, and then it, it started to scale up over time, but that's, that's another story altogether. So there, there was sort of, I think these, these sort of rival local, localized versions of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of, of these, uh, you know, very, very interestingly tasting oils uh, that were going all around at the time. So there was, um, which like oil. oil was one of them and, and probably the best market of the lot. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thanks. Like oil. Um, Okay. It, it was official. This was an official Ooh. thing. It was not, um, yeah, this was the state promoting its own version of cod liver oil, except it was called palm oil. Um, and it's nothing like the palm oil that we have today. Um, so, right. so sorry to have to intrude there, but um, oh, there, there are these parallel stories going on as well. Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much. I didn't know about that actually. Um, but I do know that there was a lot of like subsidizing and a lot of sponsoring to kind of like boost um, the image of these kind of things, a lot of aid. So yeah, that's a really interesting part that I didn't know about it. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Joshua Go has a question for Anthony. Where can we go to learn more about the Kampong community in the Botanic Gardens if, if there's anything about them written up at all? Mm. Uh, if I may add. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, there's not really much written about it. Um, um, I mean, it's it's in sources and it's referenced here and there. And I think, um, you know, getting it through the biographies of the different workers and the different, essentially the different um, local botanists who work there. So people like Hanif uh, for a brief period, um, Hassan, uh, Noor, Kia, uh, Saleh. I mean, it would be through the lives of them and, and their families. But of course, and maybe some of them are, are, are tuned in now, um, their their grandkids their their family continues on so um, I think there's a real um, opportunity and, and this is actually a project that I'm working on with um, Hanai Gomez at Yellen Yost College uh, in, in thinking about this history and you Faris uh, uh, unofficially um, we're thinking about this kind of trying to to kind of um, I think um, think differently about about um, a history of science and botany. In, in Singapore and, and really look at local contributions and local knowledge ways. And, um, and anyways, in doing that work, we think there'll be a huge, huge part for the oral history. So to Josh's question, there isn't much written about it. Um, newspapers perhaps here and there, I think, um, you know, um, uh, kind of um, stories of, that touch on the biographies of these individuals, but, but nothing, um, nothing as of yet. Yeah. All right. So um, we've got about, well, uh, just a little under 10 minutes left. Um, I think most of the other remaining questions have kind of been touched on in our previous in our exchanges so far. Um, does anyone have anything else to add? Any, any interesting uh, thoughts uh, about, you know, that, that occurred to you during the panel that, that you'd like to raise? I, I want to raise not a question. Yeah. I want to state the obvious, and that is that I think I, I loved how we all took a different approach to 
to medicine. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it speaks to and it underscores um, just the richness of thinking about food and how food is just kind of food as medicine, food as this, food as that. It's just such a, a, such a complex but yet productive um, thing. And that, um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 can, it can open up so many new spaces to understand both the past, but also the present and even maybe kind of where we're going. I mean, looking at uh, what Elliot has talked about in terms of, you know, declining species and, and just the globalization of this too. Um, you know, there's, the, I think generally when we think of food, sometimes we look at consumption or we look at production, but there's so much more that, that I think is embedded in that process of, of food and its circulation. So anyways, I just wanted to say that it, it's been great sharing this panel with you all. And um, I, I just, I've learned quite a lot. And, um, and, uh, and I'm so, I mean, I'm happy for Elliot. He just graduated, so this is fantastic. I'm happy for Faris. He also just graduated, so this is wonderful. Um, you know, Kim, you're, you're, you're gonna be a senior next year, so this is fantastic too. Faiza, it's just you and I, you know, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun, everybody. Right. Well, um, if we don't have anything more to add, I suppose we can uh, move swiftly along to the close remarks uh, and close this panel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I think that's okay. And thanks again, everybody, for for yes. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. Faris for doing the moderation for us and um, okay. and and fielding the questions. Elliot, Kim, and Faiza for your research and for sharing. Um, thanks again. Okay, all right. Um, so Anthony and um, Jeff, we can um, over to you. Yeah, thanks guys. Um, right. So Jeff. Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, I, I, um, I, I had a, I, I, think, I think we do have to give thanks to everyone again, but um, before we do that, um, maybe a bit of housekeeping. Uh, we've got still, I think 80 people in the audience, um, not, uh, that includes uh, the panelists as well. And um, I, I think this is question about what happens to all the um, all these these Q and A questions, which we haven't actually uh, managed to answer or respond to. Um, do they go into an archive, and and um, how is that going to be shared? Um, I would, think, would the events team like to to? Yeah, to I, I think maybe if if Allison is on, or the events team, or Cole. I, I think in an email I was told that there was a way to archive. I'm not sure if it was archived, but there was a way to archive it. Um, it might be available in the recording too. I'm not. I'm not too sure. Um, maybe what we could do is update folks. If the events team is not necessarily um, online right now, mm. I, they haven't jumped in. But if they are online, mm -hmm. um, maybe they could share about about uh, what you raised the the Q and A chat box. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We, we'll, we'll get back to them on that then. We'll get back yeah. to the audience on that. Um, do you want to say a few words uh, on behalf of Yale and US? Sure. I want to say, uh, you know, it was great to have this event. I mean, I, I really was, um, it was an, uh, just a great pleasure to have the events team sort of do the organization. Um, I want to just, I guess, in addition to Yale and US College and and Professor um, Tan, who gave us our opening remarks yesterday. I wanna thank uh, Jerry Lin again at uh, the Singapore Heritage Festival and her team and Nathaniel, um, Kathy Poe from Yale US, who just really did so much behind the scenes to make this, this, this possible and happen. Um, everything from the photo essays to coordinating to publicity, um, to making sure that we're on time and running smoothly and that we didn't have any you know, technological hiccups. I mean, it was just, uh, I wanna thank all of the people involved in, in bringing this to fruition and um, the audience for their great questions and comments, um, the presenters for their time and commitment. I mean, you know, 20 minutes requires a lot of research really and, uh, and people were fantastic, really great papers. So I just wanna, a big blanket overall, congratulations to everybody. It was a, it was a very fun experience, so. That's on my end. How about you, Jeff? Uh, for short and simple. Um, we, we both hope that this has been a most enjoyable and stimulating workshop for all of you. And uh, we wish you a pleasant and restful weekend ahead. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. So okay. that's so, 
yeah, <laughs> that's that's it. That's all, folks. I think that's it, folks. Um, I, I would say if anybody, public uh, or presenter, you can shoot us an email or anything. You've got at least you've got Jeff and I's emails. Um, if you want to follow up, if you want to mm-hmm. get in touch with somebody, if you want to interview somebody, if you if you have information that might help somebody's research, um, I think that's the other important thing here is because this is a very public facing event and a very public facing workshop, we're totally open to communication, suggestions, ideas, stories. Um, yeah, and just building community, I think. Um, so uh, I just wanna throw that out there, but, but like you echo, you know, thanks again to everybody. This was fantastic. Take care everyone. All righty, bye-bye.